Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. I'm Alex and I'm here with Mini PCR Bio to talk to you about one of our new learning labs, which is our COVID-19 qPCR lab, where we're going to be using the fundamentals of qPCR to detect a SARS-CoV-2 infection. I'm really excited to kick off this semester's new group of webinars. And so what we're going to be going through today is the first of them, our COVID-19 qPCR lab, but there are a number of others that are going to be coming up soon and I'll tell you all about them at the end. So in the chat today, we also have Bruce and Allison. They're going to be helping us out uh, answering some questions. So if you have questions at any point in time, please put them in the chat and Bruce and Allison are going to help us answer some of them. So I'm excited to get started with this webinar today. Before I do jump into the webinar, I do want to put out a reminder here that this is not an at-home SARS-CoV-2 detection kit, but rather a learning lab to help you bring the fundamentals of qPCR into your classroom and get students hands-on with learning the science behind this technique that is currently around us every day. So before we dive into this specific learning lab, I want to give you just a brief introduction to Mini PCR Bio. So we are a biotechnology equipment company. We make lab grade uh, equipment, including small PCR machines, gel electrophoresis machines, and fluorescence viewers to help get students hands-on with biotech equipment. And this is not just classroom grade equipment. This is real biotech equipment that is used in labs in the field and even up on the International Space Station. Now, I wanna tell you why I started working with Mini PCR Bio, and it is because in my AP Biology class, way back when, we didn't have this kind of equipment in our classroom. We all had to get onto a bus and go about 45 minutes down the road to a lab where we ran a completely fake, completely mock PCR and electrophoresis experiment. But holding a pipette in my hand at that lab, I realized that this is what I wanted to do every day for the rest of my life. So I am 100% a believer in getting students hands-on with equipment as soon as possible. And I love that Mini PCR Bio makes that even easier. So I love it. I hope that you guys will as well. And I wanna talk a little bit about how you can get this into your classroom. So today we're gonna be going through our viral diagnostics learning lab. And the idea here is that we're going to be demoing our uh, learning lab, and it's going to involve a mock uh, scenario using qPCR to diagnose a family of patients and see whether or not they have COVID-19 or some other respiratory illness. So one of the really cool things about this lab is that we're going to be using a fluorescent readout to analyze our PCR reaction. So fluorescent glowing tubes are going to tell us whether or not there is amplification with no need for gel electrophoresis. So this is going to give us really fast and easy diagnostic results all in one single tube. And it's also going to give us the option of diving deeper into the fundamentals of what's actually happening in that PCR tube and that qPCR tube if you want to bring your class to that next level. So the idea here is that if you're used to teaching PCR or doing PCR, and there are a number of resources that we're going to link in the description below, as well as sort of up in the corner once this uh, is recorded and goes live, we're going to put a bunch of uh, different resources for how to talk about PCR. But the idea behind PCR is that you're amplifying a specific piece of DNA. And if you do this in your classroom, you're probably familiar with running it out on an electrophoresis gel. This is typically how we analyze our PCR product. But today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using a small fluorescence reader to judge whether or not we got amplification instead. So it's going to be our P51 fluorescence reader. It looks just like this. It is a small blue light box. And this is going to give us our yes or no answer on our diagnostic to see whether or not a patient was infected. Now, the idea behind using fluorescence as a diagnostic tool is not a new one. And in fact, it's already in practice for things like COVID-19 out in the field. So there are a number of groups who have used a combination of PCR and some kind of fluorescence readout to actually do point of care diagnostic testing for things like COVID-19. And there are a couple examples of that here. But the important thing that I want to remind you is that these are not just point of care principles. The principles that we're going to go over today using just a PCR machine and this fluorescence reader are how all of the qPCR uh, actual diagnostic tests that if you've gotten a swab and, ha swab and had it sent off to a lab are done. So we are really going to be doing qPCR. We're just going to be doing it with smaller equipment rather than a large $10,000 machine that you might not have available in your classroom. So we're gonna go over two main things today. So first, we're gonna go over some viral diagnostic fundamentals. We're gonna walk through 
How do you even test to see if somebody does or does not have a viral infection? And then we're gonna demo the lab. We're gonna do it right here, right now. It's very easy. You can do it in your classroom. I can even do it in my apartment. So we're gonna go through how to actually do this lab. And it, again, it's got a really beautiful fluorescent readout. So this is a super fun one. It's gonna be a good day. So first things first, before we test to see whether or not you have a virus, we have to understand what a virus is. And there are lots of different viruses out there, but they really have two main parts. So first they have some sort of genome made up of either DNA or RNA. And so that DNA or RNA genome is going to store all of the instructions that that virus needs to become a virus. And then it's gonna be covered in some kind of shell. And this varies widely depending on the virus. It might be a very simple protein shell, a nucleocapsid shell. It could be in the case of something like SARS-CoV-2, a little more complicated. It might have sort of a lipid membrane. But really the point here is that you have some sort of genetic information surrounded by a shell. And that's all that a virus is. It can't even replicate itself on its own. It has to infect a host cell and use the host cell's machinery to make more of it because it itself is super simple genome, shell, that's it. So when it comes to COVID-19, this is the disease caused by a specific virus, which I'm sure you've heard about by now, SARS-CoV-2. And the idea behind sort of doing diagnostic testing is that if you just look at someone who has COVID-19, it can be hard to see whether or not they have COVID or if they have some other kind of respiratory illness. So if you think about some of the symptoms, you have a scratchy throat, you have a cough, you might have a fever. These are things that can overlap with things like the typical cold virus, the flu virus. So you wanna be able to specifically say, not just this person has an infection, but what infection they have. Because that can both help you to quarantine people and make sure that they don't spread SARS-CoV-2 further but it also can mean that they receive different treatments. So we have different treatment paths for people, whether they have the flu, whether they have COVID-19. So being able to diagnose people very specifically can help impact their treatment. Now, the other thing is that, as you may have also heard about, you can be infected with SARS-CoV-2, but actually be asymptomatic. So you might still be able to spread the virus, but you don't actually show any symptoms. So doing molecular testing is a great way to find people who are asymptomatic, but potentially spreading it. And again, isolate them to try and slow the spread of the disease. So accurate diagnostics are really essential, not just to treatment, but also to containing further spread of a virus. So what is a COVID test? I would imagine that many of us watching at this point have had a COVID test. You've had a swab up the nose that either went into something you were doing at home or something that got sent off to a lab and further analyzed. So a COVID test is a way of saying yes or no, you do or do not have an infection with SARS-CoV-2, but I'm gonna try and convince you today that it's also an excellent way to teach about viruses, biotechnology, and the interface of genetics and medicine. So you can use something that's in the news that all of us are thinking about quite a bit recently and use that to actually teach biotechnology concepts in your classroom. So there are really sort of two types of COVID tests that you might be familiar with at the moment. And the idea is that these are viral tests. There are also antibody tests looking to see if you had a past infection, but we're gonna be really focusing on viral tests. These are looking to see whether or not you have an active infection with SARS-CoV-2. Now the first kind is a nucleic acid test. This is a test that is looking for that viral genetic material. It is looking for the DNA or RNA that makes up a virus. And because SARS-CoV-2 has an RNA genome, it's specifically looking for that viral RNA from SARS-CoV-2. There are also antigen tests. So these are looking for other parts of the virus. These are looking for proteins on the outside, maybe some of those capsid proteins. These are looking for sort of the stuff of the virus rather than just that genome. And so if you really wanted to sort of broadly lump these into two categories of how you might be sort of interacting with them and experiencing them out in the world, the at-home tests that some of us have and are taking and are now you can get for free from the government, these are antigen tests. These are tests that are looking for parts of that virus. They're looking for proteins from that virus. On the other hand, we have those nucleic acid tests and these are typically the ones where you might take a swab, put it in a tube and send it off to a lab. And that is what we're gonna be doing today, is we're going to be looking at the PCR reactions behind these nucleic acid tests. Now, no matter what kind of uh, PCR you're doing, whether it's for SARS-CoV-2 or another virus, there's sort of three broad main steps that we can break this up into. 
And the first is just collecting that sample. So you want to see whether or not you have an active SARS-CoV-2 infection in your upper respiratory tract. So one of the first things you got to do is you got to take a swab of that upper respiratory tract. So this is why you have the swab up the nose. Now, you're going to have a lot of different things on that swab. So first of all, you're going to have some of your own cells. You're going to have human epithelial cells. If you uh, recall, we are all covered in our own personal microbiome. So when you take that swab, you're also going to have some bacteria on that swab. You might have other viruses present. You could have a cold virus, a flu virus, or you could have SARS-CoV-2, that virus that causes COVID-19. So when you take that swab, you're going to have a bunch of different DNA and RNA on that swab. But all you really care about is the RNA that comes from SARS-CoV-2. So we're going to need to use some way of just specifically looking at that specific piece of genetic information. But number one, you just got to collect that sample. Now, number two is that the process we're going to use to actually look at that genetic material is designed to look at DNA. But as I mentioned, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. So we have to somehow turn that RNA in that sample into DNA. And the way that we're going to do this is that you take all of the RNA out of that swab in that sample, you extract all the RNA out, and then you turn that RNA into DNA using something called a reverse transcriptase. So this is an enzyme that will go in, it will read the information from DNA, or excuse me, from RNA, and it will turn it into a piece of DNA. Now, the final step is the step that we're going to be doing today. So in this mock situation that we've set up, we've already completed the sample collection and the uh, change from RNA into DNA for you. But what we're going to be doing is specifically amplifying a piece of the SARS-CoV-2 genome from that DNA that we've now created. And by amplifying it, we're going to make lots and lots of copies of it, which is going to make it easier to see and quantify and actually analyze. And again, I want to make it very clear here that nothing in this kit is pathogenic. We are not working with the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus. We're working with sort of, uh, you know, mock samples. So nothing in here is pathogenic. This is not dangerous. And it's also not meant to be an at-home diagnostic. So this is a learning lab. It is a classroom activity. But we are going to be amplifying a piece of DNA here and using that as uh, a way to see whether or not our simulated patients do or do not have COVID-19. So now we get to do the fun part. Now we get to dive into the lab demo now that you sort of understand some of the background of it. So the idea is that we are sort of putting students into a scenario where you are working at a small COVID-19 testing site at an international airport and a family of four has just traveled back from a multi-week international trip. They've been gone for three weeks. They just took a 12-hour flight back. And on that flight back, one member of this family developed some COVID-like symptoms. So we have four patients here. We have two parents, AH and BH, and we have two children, CH and DH. And one of the parents, AH, has developed a cough and runny nose on this flight. So what we want to do is we want to be able to determine whether or not any of the members of this family are actually infected with SARS-CoV-2 or if this was just some other respiratory virus and we can let them go on home. And what we're going to do is we're going to test all of these patients using qPCR, which is the gold standard in viral diagnostics. And so you might be familiar with PCR. We're going to walk through what qPCR is today. But the idea is that you are going to do this process that is pretty much exactly what is being done at these sort of testing facilities, except, again, instead of using a $10,000 gigantic machine, we're going to be doing it using a small mini PCR thermal cycler and a fluorescent readout. Again, lots of resources we're going to put uh, both in the chat and in the description below, and we'll link them all to uh, afterwards. There's an entire video on PCR on our YouTube page here. But what I want to sort of point out is just the broad concept of PCR, that you have some kind of complex DNA sample. That is that big swab we took from the back of your uh, throat. You have a small piece of genomic uh, information of interest. This is going to be a gene from SARS-CoV-2. And you want to amplify just that piece of DNA of interest out of this big complex sample. And you can think of it a little bit like a needle in a haystack. So the haystack is all of this DNA in this complex sample that you have on your swab. The needle is just that one piece of SARS-CoV-2 uh, DNA. It was RNA, but it's now been turned into DNA that you're interested in. 
And using PCR, we're going to make a billion copies of that needle so that it totally overwhelms that haystack and it's much easier to find and analyze. So you're specifically copying and amplifying just that region of interest out of this complex genetic sample. Now again, typically when we think about doing this, we're thinking about doing PCR followed by electrophoresis. So you would run your PCR, you would take your products, you'd put them out on a gel, and they would separate out by size. Now there are a lot of nice things about gel electrophoresis. It's a very powerful tool. One of the most important is that it allows you to quantify your product by size. So if you have multiple different products in there, you can get different banding on the gel like this. You can see whether or not you have uh, different fragments of DNA of different sizes. But you have to take that uh, PCR product from those tubes and transfer it to the gel box. Now this both is a potential place where you might be introducing contamination, and it's also an additional step. So qPCR is often used for viral diagnostics because rather than having to do this additional step of PCR, it uses a fluorescence readout to look at amplification directly in the tube. Now again, typically this is done in a really big machine. There's either an LED or a laser or a fluorometer that's looking and judging how that uh, tube is getting brighter and brighter. But all we need to know for right now is that a bright tube means that there has been amplification and a not bright, not glowing tube means that there hasn't been amplification. So what you can do is you can get a quick, fast diagnostic readout all in one tube with much less chance of contamination, which is great and exactly what we wanna be doing today. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run through three main steps here. First, we're gonna use PCR to amplify a specific piece of SARS-CoV-2 genetic material from our simulated patient samples. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to visualize the results of that PCR using our P51 with just a fluorescent readout. We're gonna get a great quick diagnostic answer, yes or no for each of these patients. And then finally, we're gonna be able to compare the patients and their fluorescent readout and their symptoms and see whether or not these people have COVID-19 or not. Now to do all of this in these little tubes, and I have a couple that I've set up here beforehand, and we're gonna go through uh, in a close up in just a minute and set up our final one. But I wanna talk briefly about what is going into these tubes. So first of all, you have, uh, like with typical PCR, you have your template DNA, so that's your complex sample. You're also gonna have your DNA primers, so these are the pieces of DNA that are going to specify exactly what piece of genetic material you wanna amplify. You're gonna have a broad sort of master mix, you're gonna have your DNA polymerase, DNTPs, you're gonna have a buffer in there. But the really interesting thing about this reaction is the final ingredient. We're gonna have a qPCR fluorescent dye. And that dye is going to bind specifically to double-stranded DNA and glow. And so that is why we're gonna get this positive or negative response from this uh, sort of uh, glowing or not glowing tube. So glowing means you have a lot of this double-stranded DNA that you amplified, that dye is gonna bind to it, it's gonna be bright. Not glowing means you don't have a lot of double-stranded DNA that was amplified because nothing was amplified, so you're not gonna get a glow. So we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna set up six tubes. Um, and again, positive is gonna mean you have glowing, you got amplification, you copied that piece of SARS-CoV-2 genetic material, and not glowing is gonna mean that the patient is not infected, there was no SARS-CoV-2 in that starting tube, so there was nothing to be amplified. Glowing positive, not glowing negative. And we're gonna do this for six different samples. So again, we have our four patients. We have AH, BH, CH, and DH, our two parents and our two children. And then we're gonna have a positive control and a negative control. So the positive control should glow green. And it's important to have a positive control here because let's say I do this entire lab and I see absolutely no glowing. I don't know if that's because none of these people are infected or because I made a mistake when I was setting up the reaction. So that positive glowing tube is gonna let me know that I didn't make a mistake uh, across all of my tubes. And the negative control should not be glowing. And again, that's gonna let me know that there wasn't uh, contamination because let's say all of my tubes glow. Without a negative control, I don't know if that's because maybe my samples were contaminated, maybe my master mix was contaminated. Um, but if as long as the positive control is glowing and the negative control is not glowing, I can say that I set this up pretty much correctly and that you know I can trust the results of my patient samples. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna switch over to my other setup. I'm gonna put on some gloves here. 
and we're gonna set up our final reaction of one of these tubes. Now, there are only three things that are gonna go in here. So we have our master mix, our COVID primers, and our DNA sample. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna swap over to our, oops, I'm gonna swap over to my experiment. You know, my computer touchpad doesn't work if I have the gloves on. There we go. So we're gonna switch over to my experiment here and I believe you should still be able to hear me. And so right here in these tubes, uh, I'm going to be setting up our final reactions. So let me pop my gloves back on here for a second and show you that I have already set up five of the six reactions that we're gonna be doing today. I've already set up patients AH, BH, CH, and DH, and I have set up our positive control. And all that we're gonna be doing is I'm gonna be setting up our final reaction. Let me give you a close up of that here. Okay, so again, hopefully you can see, and let me get this to focus a little bit, that we have the first five tubes set up. Uh, and we're going to be working on that negative control tube. And I'm sorry that this is not focusing quite well, but I hope you can trust me that those first five are set up and we're going to move on to the sixth one. And again, we're only going to be adding three different things to our tube today. So the first thing that we're going to be adding is our master mix. So this is going to have the DNA polymerase. It's going to have our fluorescent dye. It's going to have our nucleotides. And we're going to add 15 microliters of this master mix to our tube. So I'm gonna set my pipette here to 15 microliters. We're getting to 15 in just a second. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna set this to 15 microliters and I am as always going to put a tip onto my pipette. And now I'm going to add 15 microliters of my master mix to our sixth tube here. All right. Then what I'm going to add next is 7.5 microliters of our PCR primers. So this is what is going to uh, tell our PCR reaction exactly what piece of the SARS-CoV-2 genome we want to amplify. So again, we have our uh, pipette set to 7.5. And now I am going to get a pipette tip and I'm going to take my lab primers and I'm going to add 7.5 microliters right here to this sixth tube. And then finally, I'm going to need to add my sample. So in each of these, I've added A, B, C, and D. My positive control is in the fifth tube. And so now I'm going to add my negative control to the sixth tube. So once again, I'm just going to get a tip and we're going to add my negative control to the sixth tube. So again, each of these tubes only has three things added to it. It's a nice, easy setup. And I'm just going to gently pipe that up and down to mix that. And so now all of our tubes are set up. I'm going to add caps to these tubes. There we go. So now we have all six of our samples set up and I'm going to add them to our PCR thermocycler. And this is where we're gonna run our reaction. So we're gonna pop these right into our mini 16. Now this is connected to my computer via Bluetooth. So now what I'm gonna do is I am going to bring you right on back to my computer and we're gonna hop in here to our actual uh, mini PCR app. So you should now hopefully all be able to see the mini PCR app. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new protocol. So I'm going to come to the plus button up at the top and I'm going to click PCR to start a new PCR protocol. And it's a very simple interface. I'm just going to name this COVID-19 qPCR uh, learning lab. We're just gonna do learning. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in and I'm just going to easily select and change all of the different uh, settings to what I want them to be. So we're gonna change the times and the temperatures and I have uh, the lab right in front of me. So I know that our initial denaturation is gonna be 15 seconds. 
And then each of these are going to be very fast. So our denaturation step is going to be three seconds. Our annealing is going to be at 58 degrees Celsius, again, for just three seconds. And then our extension is just going to be four seconds. So these are going to go very quickly. The entire PCR can run in about 35 minutes because um, we're also only going to run 25 cycles. So what I can do right now is I can click Save and Run. And that will start the run going on my mini PCR thermal cycler. So as this is uh, loading, I'll walk you through a couple of the things that we can see on this screen that's going to run. So we have uh, over here, we have just a little description of what's going on. So we're initializing, we're heating up the lid to where it needs to be. Down here, we have all the different parts of our protocol. So what is happening uh, in the tube, what I've told it to do. And then as this runs, what is going to happen over here is that we're going to start to see a graph of the temperature running. So this is going to go uh, sort of down as we begin. We're going to have to go, oh, here we go. It started. So we're starting our initial denaturation. You see there's a little uh, animation here of the two strands of DNA coming apart. You can see that the temperature is rising up. We're going to go up to hit that 94 degrees Celsius. And then over here on the right, you'll also see that there's a little graph of the number of DNA copies that we have in our tube. So we're going to assume that we're starting off with, you know, zero or one copies. And then as these different cycles progress, we're going to see this count up and up and up exponentially. So remember that as we go through PCR each time, yep, so we went from zero to two here. Each time we run a cycle, you're going to get exponential amplification of what is going on in that tube. Now, because as I mentioned, this takes uh, a little bit to try and run, you know, it's going to take about 35 minutes. What I'm actually going to do here is tell you that I've done a little bit of a cooking show uh, demonstration. And so I actually have, uh, I have some tubes pre-run for you. So we're going to jump to that in just a second. So I'm actually going to set my mini PCR to go back to hold at 72 degrees Celsius uh, because that's going to be the temperature that we want to check these tubes at. So again, very simple to set up your thermal cycler according to this protocol. You're just going in, clicking, changing the time, very simple and all run through either your computer you can run it uh, depending on the mini 16 or mini 18 off of a tablet, off of a phone. So whatever device you have, there is a mini PCR that will work with what you have in your classroom. So again, I'm going to set this to uh, hold at 72C for just a couple of minutes um, so that we can check our tubes when they're ready. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our final tubes. And again, I'm going to swap out that one that we just made. I'm going to swap this for some of my pre-made cooking show samples. Uh, so I already have some tubes that I've run out to 25 degrees Celsius. We're going to let those heat up to 72 degrees, which is where we want to see them and judge them to see whether or not there is this glowing or not. But I also have an image here that I've taken so that we have one uh, already done. And we can look while that's heating up for just a couple seconds at our positive and negative control. So this is what our positive and negative control should like, look like. You should have gotten amplification in the positive control, which will give you that bright uh, glowing green. And you should not have gotten amplification in the negative control. So you should see that negative tube not glowing at all. And so what I can do right now, and again, we'll walk through it on the screen, but I have my P51 fluorescence viewer here. So it's a little blue light viewer. And you can see if I tell this, you can see that blue light inside and it's just got an orange screen right on the front. And I'm going to take my tubes that have already been cycled through 25 cycles. And I'm going to pop them right on out of my thermal cycler and right on into the P51 and hold them up here. Uh, here, we're going to switch to a slightly different view here. We're going to come to just my webcam. And you can see that over on the far right, my positive control is glowing and my negative control is not. And then we have glowing in maybe the first three tubes in my sample. Now, again, we got a little bit of reflection here, so I've got a picture in my slides and we're gonna walk through these slides. So in AH, uh, what you might be able to see on the camera and hopefully can definitely see in my PCR slide is that we have glowing in AH. I'll get a little closer here. So AH is glowing. BH is also glowing. CH is glowing and DH is not glowing. So what this means is that we had positive amplification in our first three samples and our positive control, which is great. 
and we did not have amplification in our fourth sample, DH, and we also didn't have it in our negative control, which is great. So what we can do here just by looking at that cycle 25 data is we can get a yes or no answer for each of these patients, and we can look and see do they or do they not have positive tests for COVID-19? And unfortunately, our first three patients do have positive tests for COVID-19. So that cough and runny nose that was developed on the plane, that is indicative of actually being infected. And so this family, uh, the first three members of this family, should be recommended to go and isolate and quarantine. So this is the first way that you can run this lab. You can run this lab really quickly. Uh, so I just saw a uh, comment come in. So DH should get away from these people. I believe the current recommendations would be that A, B, and C should isolate and D should also quarantine because I imagine that being on a family vacation, they've been around them quite a bit. But yes, you would want to isolate the people who are currently uh, positive from people who are currently negative. So yes, definitely be careful about that. But thankfully, these are all sim simulated patients. This is not a real family. Um, but so this entire lab going from setup to the final uh, evaluation can be run in just one, about 50 minute period. The entire PCR takes just about 35 minutes to run. It is a straightforward, clear molecular diagnostic test. You can look at these tubes really quickly and get a yes or no answer. And one of the nice things here is that you actually really only need one thermal cycler for the entire class. And you can also do it with just one fluorescent readout as well. So you don't need individual uh, machines for each group. So it can be a quick, fast way to get to an endpoint diagnostic. But what I'm really excited to show you about is that you can also use this lab to dive a little deeper into the science behind both PCR and qPCR. So not just looking at that endpoint diagnostic, which is wonderful and exciting on its own, and it's great that this can all happen in one tube, we can get a yes or no answer, but also we can dive a little deeper into the science. And I will tell you that I did not get a good explanation of the science behind qPCR until I was in graduate school. So the fact that this can be done now in a high school or sort of early biology classroom is fantastic and makes me personally very excited. So the idea here is that qPCR also stands for quantitative PCR. So not only are you looking for whether or not PCR amplification happened, qPCR can actually give you some sort of quantitative result as to how much DNA was actually as a starting point in that tube. And we're gonna walk through how that works, but the main goal behind it is that fluorescent, or the main function behind it is that fluorescent dye that as you amplify your DNA cycle after cycle after cycle in PCR, you're gonna get more double-stranded DNA and more of that green fluorescent dye is gonna bind. So as the cycle progresses or as the cycles progress, your tube is gonna get brighter and brighter. So you can actually watch that progression happen. So we're gonna walk through this in a graph form first. So on our x-axis here, we have PCR cycle number. And on our y-axis, we have relative fluorescence of that tube. So remember, PCR is exponential. You start with one, you go to two, four, eight, 16, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're first starting to go through those cycles, and here we've got sort of cycle zero through cycle nine, you are amplifying DNA, you are getting more of it, but those numbers are still pretty low. You're not gonna be able to see that by eye in your tubes quite yet. However, you're gonna reach an inflection point and this is gonna be our cycle threshold where you actually can see that fluorescence because now you're gonna be going you know, from 16 to 32 to 64 and then suddenly you're gonna really quickly ramp up. You're gonna get that exponential amplification and as that happens, the brightness is gonna get exponentially brighter. So you're gonna be able to actually see it. So here on this graph, we have this little uh, arrow. And so this is the cycle at which that fluorescence is first detectable either by eye or in these very expensive machines using you know, an LED or a fluorometer or in the old style ones, a laser. Now again, as these cycles continue, you're still gonna get more and more and more amplification. You're gonna get brighter and brighter and brighter tubes, but eventually you are gonna reach a stage where you've run out of DNTPs, you've run out of those reagents in the tube, and you're just gonna plateau at a certain brightness. You're not gonna get any more amplification and the tube isn't going to get any brighter but you can actually watch the tube get brighter as these cycles progress. So if we look at three different samples here, we can start to learn things about the original composition of what was in those tubes based on what these curves look like. So sample one, we never see any fluorescence. This indicates that the piece of DNA we were trying to amplify just wasn't present in that tube. 
We were never able to get any fluorescence. We were never able to get any amplification. Sample one here hits that cycle threshold at cycle 11. Sample three also hits a cycle threshold where you can start to see it, but it happens later. So what this means is that there was less of that starting product, less of that starting material in sample three than there was in sample two. That's why that curve came up slower because there was less of that starting material. Now, Bruce, who's in the chat, told me the best analogy for this at one point, so I'm always going to talk about it, is that it's a little bit like looking at a marathon. If you just show up at the end of the marathon and you see all of the runners milling about, you can tell who ran the race, right? So that's like looking at cycle 30 here. You can say that sample two and sample three, they amplified. But you can't say anything about who arrived first or last. QPCR allows you to actually look at that race as it's being run. It allows you to see who comes in first and who comes in second and lets you make a decision about in the race who ran faster or in these tubes which one had more or less starting material. So QPCR is really the gold standard for a lot of viral testing including COVID testing. So there are a lot of pros to it. So one of them is that it is extremely sensitive. So you can see amplification of much smaller amounts using a qPCR machine than you would be able to by doing PCR and running it on a gel. You can get really specific, really sensitive analysis. Also, it all happens in the same tube. So typically you're putting your tubes into a machine and the uh, machine is checking the fluorescence each cycle as the PCR is running. So at the end of the PCR, you already have your yes or no answer of whether or not there was amplification. You don't have to take it to a second step. So you're getting a really automated high throughput answer and you're limiting that potential for contamination because you don't have to take it to an electrophoresis gel. And it will also give you this quantitative data. However, the machines that this is run on, as I've mentioned before, are expensive. These are many thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars machines. Again, I didn't see a QPCR machine until I was in grad school. They're also not portable. They are about the size of a mini fridge. They are large, they're expensive, and they're just not accessible to most classrooms. So what we have done in this lab is we have split apart the two pieces of a QPCR machine. We have the thermal cycler and we have fluorescence detection. And your students are going to be the qPCR machine that combines these two by running the PCR and then judging that fluorescence by eye. So we have taken a true qPCR reaction. This is just how it runs, but we've split apart those two parts so that your student is doing it themselves. It is still extremely sensitive. It still has, uh, you know, a single tube, so it's lowering that potential for contamination. We're going to give you some semi-quantitative data, and I'm excited to show you what the graphing for that looks like. And it's way cheaper, and it's portable. You can actually take this out into the world. So the way that this is going to happen is you're going to set up the tubes exactly the same way. You're going to do exactly the same lab setup. You're only putting three different things into the tubes, but each time your samples hit 72 degrees Celsius, you're going to actually look at how bright that fluorescence is. Now, you can do it each time. That might take a little bit. So we simplify that a little bit. You're going to look at the data after cycle one, and then you're going to look at it every three cycles starting at cycle 10. So you're going to judge the fluorescence in each of these tubes every three cycles, and your students are going to write it down. So we give them a chart like this. This is available in the classroom activities. So they have all of the different tubes, and we've got a really sort of semi-quantitative scale here. We're going from zero, which is no fluorescence, to three, which is totally bright, flu full fluorescence. So here we're looking at a set of tubes from cycle 13, and I've already filled in the graph here for you for cycles one and 10, no fluorescence in any of the tubes. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at cycle 13 and we're gonna say, okay, is there any fluorescence in any of these tubes? And what I would say, it's a little hard to see in the picture, but if you look at it by eye, maybe tubes AH and CH in the positive control are starting to have a little bit of fluorescence. And again, this is slightly dirty data, but it is real data that your students are collecting by eye. So you're gonna you know, fill this chart out. So cycle 13, maybe a little bit of fluorescence. By cycle 16, I think it's a lot easier to see that, okay, AH, CH in our positive control are a little bit brighter. I'm gonna fill those all in at about a one and maybe BH has a little bit of fluorescence. 
We're going to do the same thing for cycle 19. Now you can really see that the fluorescence in these tubes is starting to get brighter and brighter. And we're going to go through all of these tubes until we get to cycle 25. And we're going to see uh, that uh, AH, BH, CH, and our positive control have all become full brightness. And again, you're doing the same lab setup. You're using the same two tools. But all you're going to do is every three cycles, you're going to pause the mini PCR app in either you know your computer, your phone, your tablet, whatever it's running on. You're just going to pause it. You're going to take those tubes out of the machine. You're going to pop them into your P51 viewer, and you're going to write down your observations. When you're done, you're going to take those tubes out, pop them back in the thermal cycler, and let them run for another three cycles. So again, this is the same thing that happens in a qPCR machine where, you know, one of those really expensive machines where it runs a cycle and it looks to see how bright that fluorescence is. Your students are doing the same thing. They're just doing it by eye rather than by the computer. And I think this is fantastic because, again, running qPCR, you typically put your tubes in, you walk away, you come back and, I don't know, the computer gives you an answer, a yes or no, but you don't really get that understanding of what is happening inside the tubes. By doing it this way, you are getting that semi-quantitative data. You are following it cycle, th three cycle by three cycle, so you can actually see what's happening. So now what you can do is you can graph that data. And this is where I think it gets super cool. So uh, in purple here, down on that x-axis, we have our negative control. We never saw any amplification, no fluorescence. It's a straight line. Our positive control, we did start to see fluorescence around cycle 13, and then it gets brighter and brighter as we go along. Now we can start to layer in our patient data. So patient AH see, shows a cycle uh, and a curve that is almost exactly like our positive control. Comes up really bright, stays really bright. BH, on the other hand, doesn't show that same curve. We don't start to see really uh, clear fluorescence in BH until we get to about cycle 16 to 19, somewhere in there. So it likely had a lower amount of starting material than patient AH. It had a smaller viral load than AH. Now, CH looks just like our positive control, and DH, as we said, we never saw any uh, fluorescence. We didn't get any amplification out of it. But just by looking at this fluorescence by eye, even though these aren't as smooth as the curve that you could get off of a qPCR machine and the associated computer, you are still getting a real visible curve where you can see not just a yes or no answer, but something semi-quantitative and something different between sample BH and the other two positive samples. So by comparing these CT values, you can actually see that BH had a lower starting material, a lower viral load than the other two patients, AH and CH. And I think this is just super cool that you can see this by eye with the little fluorescence viewer and the thermal cycler. You don't need a super fancy expensive machine to do this. You can do this all by yourself and you get these plots where you can actually see the difference. So this is really great. So in one about 80 minute time period, you can actually look at qPCR curves. You can talk about what is happening inside those tubes. You can talk about exponential amplification. You can talk about viral loads. You can actually really dive deep into those qPCR concepts. Now for this, it is a little bit easier if you have multiple mini PCRs and fluorescent readers. They can be shared between groups in the classroom, but that way, because you're going to be taking tubes in and out, it's a little easier to have multiples. But Again, depending on the level of your classroom and what you want to dive into, you can do just that endpoint detection, which gets you to a fast, clear diagnostic result, or you can take it a step further and go through time point uh, collection with qPCR to really dive into the fundamentals of what's going on in those tubes. Now, the other really cool thing you can do, again, as a potential expansion, is you can then take just what was in these tubes and run it out on a gel electrophoresis. If you do want to take it to an additional level and you do want to see those bands run out, the expected uh, length of those bands is about 400 base pairs. And so again, here you can see positive results for AH, BH, and CH. There's no band for DH. And then you get a band in your positive control and no band in your negative control. So you don't have to do this. You do not need a gel electrophoresis set up to run this lab. But if you want to add that final component, you can, which is really nice. So in conclusion, uh, before we get to some FAQs and some other additional ways that uh, you can sort of modify this to your classroom, you can use biotech tools that your students are already familiar with, things like PCR amplification and a fluorescent viewer, and you can actually see DNA amplification 
during PCR. And again, I can't understate this, that I did not see this at any point in my schooling, right? High school, undergrad, grad school, I never saw DNA amplification real time during PCR until I did this lab, which I think is super cool. So you can do this and you can actually make both PCR more accessible and you can make advanced protocols like qPCR that most uh, people don't have access to really, really accessible in your classroom. So there are a couple of other things, uh, some FAQs that you might ask, your students might ask that I want to go over before we finish up here. And I've been seeing lots and lots of uh, great questions coming in in the chat. And it looks like Allison and Bruce are handling a lot of them, which is awesome. But there are a couple that we pulled up beforehand. Um, so one of them is whether or not we can actually use qPCR primers in a standard PCR reaction. And standard PCR primers uh, can be used for SARS-CoV-2 detection. And so in something like this, yes, that's why I wanted to show you that uh, you actually can see those bands if you run them out on the gel. So you can do this without doing uh, sort of this fluorescence amplification if you want, you can actually take that and run it out on a gel and it'll work just fine because the same thing is happening in that tube. You are amplifying those pieces of DNA. You are getting that double-stranded DNA. So there's no reason why you can't run it out on a gel. Another question that I think I've actually seen uh, come up in the chat a little bit, but we did also want to highlight too, is what equipment you need to run this lab. And again, very simple equipment compared to most uh, qPCRs. So you need some kind of thermal cycler. And again, if you're gonna do the qPCR uh, time point detection, it's nicer if you have a couple of these in your classroom so students can be swapping tubes in and out. And then you need some way of measuring your fluorescence. So this is our P51 glow box. It's a adorable little uh, cardboard box with a picture of Rosalind Franklin in it named for photo 51. Um, but if what you have in your classroom already is something like a blue light illuminator, a blue gel setup, you don't actually need the P51. If you already have something like this that has a blue light and an orange cover, you can put your tubes directly into that blue gel instead of the gel, or you can use one of our new little viewing racks where you can actually, uh, it's cute and I don't have mine in front of me, but you can see here, you can put your little tubes in and it holds a little orange shield in front of that blue light. So you can view these in a blue light illuminator as well. Um, but P51 makes it very nice and handy and makes it really accessible for lots of students in your classroom to get hands-on with it, which I think is great. The other thing is that there is already, if you wanna talk with your students about sensitivity and specificity, which is a question that has come up a lot around uh, COVID tests, there's already in the curriculum a discussion of uh, true positives, false negatives, and sensitivity and specificity in the curriculum for this lab. And I wanna make that point as well, that all of the resources for this lab are free and available to download on our website. So you can go to uh, this page with mini PCR product, uh, COVID qPCR. There's also a link straight to our COVID resources. So the lab guide, the teacher's guide, classroom slides, this video will be there once it's done. Um, video resources on PCR, all of the curriculum for all of our labs is free and available to use in your classroom. So if you do wanna use this lab, you can download all of the information for it beforehand. You can look through all of that first, or you can just take the slides and use them in your classroom. They're free and they're out there. So take any of this that you want to help teach. Um, it is all there ready and waiting for you. And we do have a number of additional COVID webinars around uh, viruses and vaccine production as well if you wanna bring those into your classroom. And all of those as well are freely available on our website. Finally, I wanna put in a little bit of a plug here for our remaining uh, webinars of the semester. So this was our first one. This was to kick off our new COVID qPCR lab. There's another one coming in February, which is our new chopped CRISPR lab, which I've gotten hands-on with recently and is super fun and brings the fundamentals of CRISPR to your classroom. Uh, again, in a totally true, totally real way. Um, we're also gonna have a discussion of CRISPR gene therapy on March 28th. We're gonna be working through our P51 enzyme lab in April. And then there's also gonna be a little mini series on electrophoresis basics in May. And so if you're running electrophoresis in your classroom, you're gonna get really hands-on with the many different ways to do that. And we have a lot of different ways that are available depending on what your classroom needs are. You can tune in in May for that. And as always, all of these webinars are freely available afterwards on YouTube. Um, you can go and check out all of our videos, all of our resources there and on our website. And so with that, it looks like there's still a couple questions coming in in the chat, but that Bruce and Allison and Sebastian are doing, and Zeke are doing an awesome 
uh, method of actually answering all of those. So I think I'm going to let them keep on doing that. And I want to say thank you again so much for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to leave them in the chat, to leave them in the comment section, or to email us at mini PCR bio. And I hope you can bring this into your classroom and really get those fundamentals of qPCR that are popping up in the news all the time. I hope that this is an easy tool to get those into your classroom a little bit easier and a little more accessible. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. This was super fun. I hope you all enjoyed it and have a wonderful rest of your day.